maybe if you want. What's that, Anne? Yeah, maybe what? if you go in about an, about say forty minutes, forty five yeah. minutes in. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're starting our call for our Bucky Weekend call on uh, October 26, 27, depending on what continent you're on. And we're going to read a Buckminster Fuller from page 23 on my book, but um, the, uh, the title of the page is Which Way is Up? In the last couple of weeks, we've read through, you guys read through uh, the, the, irration the irrationality of pi and how nature isn't using pi and uh, how finite accounting and about a finite accounting system. And the next section is which way is up? And that's where we're gonna start. And we're just the two of us. We've sent messages out to uh, Richard and Joe and, um, and haven't heard anything back yet. So Anne, how are you feeling? And uh, what yours, is your intention to get out of the call today? Yes, I'm looking forward to actually today's uh, meeting because um, uh, the the book that we are, we are going through, uh, Buck, uh, Bucky, A Full Explanation, I, it's, it's opening a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, not doors, but a lot of, um, like my mind space, yeah? A lot of, a lot of uh, mind space here that um, is very, very relevant to, and, and the way, it's more the way Amy Edmondson has actually, um, uh, curated the book and Bucky's content and so on. That's that's compelling, very compelling to me. Okay, um, like like one of the things that the, this particular chapter. First thing is this this whole thing about pi, the yeah. irrationality of pi. I'm like, oh my god, I'm going to talk. Uh, we're going to be going to do pi, right? Uh, and uh, it's just okay. You you know where I'm going with it, right? <laughs> It doesn't seem like okay, but anyway, what I got out of it was um this chapter was is okay. I'm, I've got it written down here. It's actually perfect, a perfect chapter to show the the fact that education and reality do not match. Yeah, yeah, just do they just do not match, and if we're wondering why the kids are faltering and struggling and so on, um, because what they see actually. Actually, a lot of times I, I've been dealing with children all, all these years and teenagers. Um, it, it is this lack of, of um, uh, like reason. Reason is not there, number one. Number two is that the fact that it doesn't make sense. And children, big children and teens, half the time they, they don't have the words nor um, the ability to, to, to tell you exactly what it is that, that's not sitting right with them. And uh, in most cases, this shows up, uh, this, this lack of being able to put into words what's not comfortable for them shows up in either misbehavior or people uh, people label it as rebellion or the fact that they're just challenging and stubborn and lazy and all that it shows up in this manner. And so over the years, as far as we could make, it, as far as we could take it, right, we would always make sure that it makes sense to the kids and it's based on reality and it, and we bring it and link it to them. And oh, and we found that the kids just, they, they thrive in that. They thrive in that. So but this chapter is just perfect for that. And the other one is that because of the pie thingy he started off, um, you know what? Math has been made more important than nature itself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The whole, uh, con the concepts of math, um, you know, physics and chemistry and biology and whatever they break down and, and how we should learn it, they've made it way, way more important than nature itself. Um, yeah. And yeah, so, so those were the things that I got out of it last week, uh, going through that uh, with, with Joe. Uh, so we, we, had a, we had a really lovely time, uh, you know, with the session last week. Yeah, and, I, yeah. And, and the other thing was I was sharing with him what was going on with our esports. Uh, we, we started, one of our schools is focusing on esports education. That's going to be the driving thing for. Yeah, uh, so I'm not sure it got captured in the recording on that one. As we I think it did. I think that we right at the end you kind of showed that, and I'll just yeah. share the whole screen here. Uh, mm -hmm. I used that that thing right there. That's what that's what you shared at the end of last week's call, right? Is that what yes. you're referring to? Is no, no. Actually, actually, oh. way there was way more than that. I don't think we captured it. You know, <clears throat> so. Uh, because one of the, when we went down this path of esports education, if you don't mind, it, or maybe we can take it after, after your sharing first. Well, I don't, I don't mind you going through it right now. 
Okay, I just, just, yeah, so you can have it recorded because I don't think it got in at the beginning. Because uh, we went through this um, educate, uh, we, we are, every school that we have right now, we, we, we are giving the kids a reason for them to learn whatever they're learning academically, right? Because otherwise it doesn't make sense. And um, so esports education is one of them. And uh, it was, it for me, I when we went down this path, another like light bulb moment went off because <clears throat> already entrepreneurship we knew it was the great one of the is the greatest leveler of society economically socially and so on um and then we re and then when we went down this path with esports education it is also the other one that's the greatest leveler you know you look at all the the, the people who became really amazing esports uh, the, the champions right um they they don't have muscles they don't they are not considered like the jocks but um they're nerdy they're they may be out of shape they may not be good looking but nobody cares nobody cares you know and you can you can be in a wheelchair or not you can have legs or not you can be any in any part of the world it does not matter and if you look at the way i can i can send you some videos where um the the, 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 the scale of the competitions, the tournaments, it's crazy. It's crazy. So it's, it's, and it's, it's one of those things that are pulling people together. Whichever part of the world you're in, pulling people just together. So, um, and whether you're in a rich country, not good school, not good school, great student, not a great student, you can excel there. That was one of the things that I, I realized. The second thing that came up for me was that, uh, we, we duck deep, you know, we duck deep in order to make sense of it for the parents, right? And one of the things that came out was that um, I, I said, go and, go and find out uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the game-changing innovations that has impacted the world across all industries and like as many industries in our lives, right? So because we were thinking of crypto, crypto came up from from games, uh, metaverse came out from games. Um, the other one we were talking about was uh, blockchain and um, um, IoT, right? So I got my people to dig deep into this, and we just put out, you know, um, what are the other things that came out? My God, the list is very long, and we all recognize them. It's part of our lives. It's in our phones. It's in everything: facial recognition, voice recognition, you know, eye tracking. Uh, digital twins um, you're looking at drone tech right without the console with, without the device to control we won't have drone technology right um, uh, what, what do we have some more AR, VR, I, I, uh, AI um, graphic processing unit uh, we, we just and got AR. the <laughs> AR as yeah. well augmented AR yes AR, AR. Yeah, yeah AR, VR, AI all so you, you just imagine and, and so we pointed it, this out to parents that it started 30, 40 years ago it's not like because people went into esports realized then they started creating these things it's people who were so insistent on esports in, for 30, 40 years that these things started evolving out of it you know so when we told parents that they're like you know it, it made them pause right i said because there are there were parents in the audience that uh, who were considered wasting time back then but i said if they were if that is wasting time then where did all this come from you know <laughs> yeah it was developed because these people were considered were considered wasting time yeah. um so this is one of the biggest drivers for us when we're dealing with the children and what parents perceive as a waste of time so i told them actually even way before the esports i told them whatever your kids are doing and you consider a waste of time they are all multi-billion dollar businesses, trillion dollar businesses, and the kids are going to, your children are going to want to get into those businesses when they start working. So they are not a waste of time. So it's, yeah. it's these things that we have to start shifting. Then <laughs> the other thing that came out was we dug further into the, the unexpected skills that came out from serious gamers, you know, that they acquired. Oh, the list was 50 long. And that's the one that you saw I, I shared with in our group chat, you know. Uh, that's that's why it was it was uh, sent there. And the last thing, uh, yeah, Joe is here. Yeah. So the last thing, uh, we, we talked to parents. Hi, Joe, I'm updating um, Steve on uh, what we talked about last week. Oh, good. Yeah. Summarizing it. And, and, and the last bit that we talked, to, I was sharing with him because we were talking to parents that uh, the traditional education systems 
okay, our, our training and getting the students to be ready for the, the business world of 1980s to 2020. And these kids are going to graduate any anytime between 2030 to 2040. Wow. That was, yeah, it was another, another, you know, bam for the parents. And, and the last thing is we told them that our school is living in 2040. Wow. Yeah. That takes my breath away because we have no concept of what the world will be like in 2040, let Thanks. alone 2030. We have no idea. Yes. I mean, yeah. In five years, it'll start to morph. And in 10 years, holy mackerel. Yes, exactly. So anyway, um, so uh, Joe, how do you feel? And what would you like to take away today? Oh, I mean, I feel actually, I feel wonderful. Um, apologies uh, for a little bit of tardiness here. But, uh, um, you know, I, I really did appreciate actually what you were sharing. Uh, and last week. Uh, on a and 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 it, it's interesting. It's when you even say the word training, it's like it's this idea that we were being trained to do something just actually repetitively. Um, and now we're it's like more of an experience where we're actually learning something. Uh, and and it's it's where we're able to be a little bit more creative. Uh, when you're actually more immersed, uh, in the learning itself. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it really is exciting. Uh, I mean, as far as, you know, the possibilities as to, uh, growing up during that period and, you know, to Steve's point, um, I think that, uh, you know, we really don't know what it's going to look like in the next few years. Uh, and, and it really is, it's, uh, I think this is where it, it's, uh, important to, to, be able to be able to uh, to adapt uh in so far as like kind of not even necessarily just from a work standpoint from just a purely learning standpoint and I really appreciate what learning uh is all about as opposed to just learning to do a task uh and that's a really important thing because I think it's an idea of where meaning uh has like kind of in the sense that learning in it of itself becomes meaning uh as opposed to learning just to train for something um you know uh for me this evening um my my the things that i want to continue to take away are just uh specifically um i was going through some things in this week at work where I, uh, you know, saw a lot of Bucky's ideas, uh, and was able to kind of convert them, uh, you know, some of the, some of the words and language that he used. Sometimes, actually, the exact words he used. Um, we were going through some naval systems, uh, and I could actually see where uh, things like reverse torque, torque. I mean, which is that's not specific to Bucky, but some of the other terms that were used uh, that were very much specific to uh, uh, specific to Bucky that helped me understand the inner workings of a ship. And uh, what my continued takeaway is, is by going through this book in particular, uh, it helps me with um, kind of reconciling some of those concepts and language. Uh, so that that's essentially what I find to be the most beneficial about, you know, kind of going through, uh, you know, floor ex, uh, experience. Uh, so um, for me, that's I just look to continue to to take away, um, you know, uh, some of the ideas and and synthesize them in a way that I could actually use them at work. Uh, so I'm excited about that. I mean, if you think about it, Bucky was worked worked for the Navy. So, Steve, welcome back. Yeah. yeah. It's good to see you. You look out. good. You look like, I mean, <laughs> you do. You look good. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I have a lady friend here from Maryland. She went with me to, yeah, uh, Julie. to right. uh, Vipassana. It's very strange to find people who are willing to sit for 10 days. 
and not say anything with a noble vow of silence. And she was willing and able to do it and had a great time. And, and uh, so I'm having a good time. This whole section on, I sure appreciate you guys sharing. Um, I got a chance to listen to the recording a lot, last week a little bit. So I know where we're starting today, but this whole section is about, you know, he talked, we just, we, if, if you read above on page 23, where we're going to start, he talks about a finite accounting system. What does a finite accounting system mean? It means a more appropriate unit is called for. For now, however, we simply consider a qualitative implications of discrete events. Pi is not a discrete event. You know, it's an irrational number. And we teach our kids irrational science. We don't teach our kids event science, discrete events. Look, this is happening, and it's not happening in thin air. It's happening in a context of something. One bubble is next to another bubble. <laughs> I think it's just, I think it's profound. And we're going to go which way is up. I've been thinking, thinking more and more about, I was at, at the retreat. I saw uh, every day we were up at, at uh, 4.30, uh, walking to the meditation hall. And uh, usually uh, the moon, we, it was a full moon and <laughs> you could hardly see any stars. But by 6.30, when we walked out of the meditation hall to go into breakfast, the moon was almost set down below. The sun was almost rising and Orion was blazing and Jupiter was up there and Mars was up there and the Big Dipper was up there and it just was freaking beautiful. And um, uh, there's nothing irrational about that, you know? Um, and I just love nature and I kept thinking about, you know, sunrise or sunset, you know? And I, and I re realized that dawn it doesn't say that the sun is coming up but so Don at least is not incorrect. I like sun sight and I like sun clips, but dusk um, is, is neither sunset, you know, it's not sun setting, it's, it's dusk. So anyway, I was thinking all about this and I'm thinking about how the language we have tends to fog everything up. And here we're looking for clarity. And there is no clarity when you're teaching irrational stuff. And so I really like this idea of talking about a finite accounting system. And I love the idea that we're going to continue here with this next section, which is which way is up. We're going to go from there. So any other comments or questions before we start to read? No, thank you. No, glad Thanks. you're back. Good, good to be back. Good to be back. And um, this is not acting normally, but it's working really good. And um, you guys can see that. Maybe I'll read, because I've been out for a while and notice I'm a little bit hoarse, I'll read for a minute and then a couple paragraphs, then we can pick up and share from there and let's all rotate around and read. Which way is up? I think that's where you guys left off. Fuller proposed a, rash, uh, a revolution in modes of thinking and problem solving, which above all else required con a comprehensive uh, approach, as will be discussed in chapter 16. To Fuller, comprehensive means not leaving out anything. L uh, least of all, humanity's important tool of language. A dictionary contains an inventory of 20, uh, 250,000 agreements, he explains. Sp specific sounds developed as symbols for 250,000 um, nuances of experience. Boy, do I like that. That is really powerful. I'm going to have a section in my book on... Um, on extreme speech. And I, I love the idea that a word in a dictionary is an agreement. We've all agreed to say yes. book is book, only by agreement, not because book means anything, right? He saw this gradual accomplishment of one of the most remarkable developments in the history of humanity with its implied cooperative effort. Because when I was in school, I didn't learn that a word was we agreed to a word. I was tortured with the dictionary definition and spelling. You know, one aspect of this of his revolution thus involves an effort to employ words accurately. Fuller's discourses on the subject tend to be quite humorous, almost, but not quite, concealing how deeply serious 
he was about the matter. Much of our language is absolutely stuck in dark ages thinking. Um, he would lecture up and down, for instance. These two words um, are remnants of humanity's early perception of flat earth. There oh is no up and no down in universe, explains That's Fuller. Right. Yeah, actually, I've come to see that there's value I'm... in up and down locally, like yes. with a ladder. You know, you can't climb out a ladder and in a ladder. You climb up a ladder and down a ladder. That's a local application. But in terms of universal applications, there is no up and down. And we're a plane. We're a plane, as you used to say, right? It's what? It's a plane, right? Uh, when you were talking about it in terms, it's it's not. Um, uh, it, there is an up and down when it comes to a, a plane. Like yeah. you're either going up. Uh, yeah. Or was it up the stairs? I, I forgot. Yeah, upstairs is what I was saying. Uh, yeah. so, I'm sorry. Yeah, up the stairs. Like if you're walking up yeah. the stairs of a plane, forgive me. All right. Yeah. Well, I don't know. A plane is probably appropriate. You want to bring the plane down safely. I mean, right. That doesn't make sense. You don't want to bring, although many pilots say bring it in, right? Bring the plane in safely. So, yeah. No right. kidding. Yeah. Up and down, for instance, these two words are remnants of humanity's early perception of flat earth. There is no up and down universe, explains Fuller. When we say look down at the ground or I'm going downstairs, here he's gonna he's gonna talk about it. We reinforce an underlying sense of perception of a platform earth. Neither the ground nor Australia can accurately be referred to as down. <laughs> Three hours after a man in California says that the astronauts are up in the sky, the shuttle is located directly below his feet, <laughs> you know, in the direction of his feet. Up and down are simply not very precise in a spherical planet. The, the remnants, the replacements, in and out. The, the radially organized systems of universe have two basic directions, in toward the center and radially out in plurality of directions. We got somebody coming in here. Who do we got coming in? No. It's Richard. Wonderful. Uh, airplanes go out to leave and back into land on Earth's surface. Sir, he brings it right up, um, Joe. Uh, he contradicts me completely. Uh, we go right. into, whoops. We go in, uh, let me see. Airplanes go out and back into Earth's surface. We go in toward the center of the Earth when we walk downstairs. That's a yeah. substitution <laughs> seems somewhat trivial at first, but again, it's a different. It's difficult to judge without trying them out. Experimenting with in and out can be truly reorienting. Unexpectedly, one does feel more like a part of a finite spherical system, an astronaut on spaceship Earth. It's hard to keep uh, at it for long, however. Up and down reflexes are very powerful or powerful. Okay, I'm. anybody else want to read? Anne, sure. do you want to read? Okay, sure. Okay. Um, from, okay. The sun does not go down, insists Bucky. How long are we going to keep lying to our children? First of all, we now know there is no up and down in the solar system. And secondly, the sun is not actively touring around the earth. Rather, we are the travelers and our language should reflect that knowledge. Oddly, the phraseology which gives the sun an active role. Darling, look at the beautiful sun going down. The seem to reinforce the erroneous conception of a yellow circle traveling across the sky. While we know this isn't the case, it often feels like the way things happen. This effect is not easily measured and probably varies from individual to individual. What does all this have to do with geometry? Remember that one of the goals of synergetics is to help coordinate our senses with reality, that is to put us in touch with universe, which to Fuller involves eradication of the erroneous vocabulary Oh, I got to change a page. Here yep. we go. I'm I'm looking for something to share, and so I've lost my bearing. Hang on, I've fallen in a trap. <laughs> oh my gosh! I've got to stop sharing and do this again. Hang on, I'm so sorry. Here we go. Here no we go. problem. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? 
Oh, I think. Uh, I'm not sure. Share screen. I'm going to have to just go ahead and share the screen and I'm going to find. Oh, I know where it is. It's in here. There we go. Okay, good. Where did I cut you off at? Um, Let's see. I think uh, it's above the um, geometry or the, 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 um, eradication of the and uh, oh yeah, okay. I'll just put that again. Uh, to put us in touch with universe, which to Fuller involves eradication of the erroneous vocabulary, which keeps us locked into dark ages thinking on a sensorial level. In short, we need to align our reflexes with our intellect. Instead of sunset and sunrise, reinforcing the sun's active role, Fuller suggests sun clips and sun sight which imply instead that our view of the sun has been obscured and that an obstacle has been removed, respectively. Who knows if people could adjust to such substitutions? It might be worth a try. And if I may just say there, I kind of brought this up. When I was, when I was at Vipassana and I was out at 4.30 in the morning and 6.30 in the morning, to really notice that it was a sun sight and not think of a sun rise really put it in perspective in terms of the of Orion being up there and just the just the fact that I was in a galaxy and and so you know I want just want to reaffirm that that's kind of what I was saying right there go ahead okay I have to try the cube is another remnant of flat earth days and Fuller has a wealth of reasons to prefer another mathematical starting point which will be discussed through this volume. Our age-old dependence on squares and cubes is honored by an unfortunate verbal shorthand for x to the second power and x to the third power. The expressions x squared and x cubed are so commonly used that most people assume these multiplication functions to have a true and exclusive relationship to squares and cubes. The shorthand squared is derived, of course, from the fact that the square can be subdivided by parallel lines with x subdivisions along each edge into x to the second power smaller squares. For example, a square with two modular subdivisions per edge, per edge contains four small squares. And similarly, two subdivisions, uh, three subdivisions yield nine, nine squares. 4 yield 16, 5 yield 25, and so on. Everyone is familiar with these diagrams, but what most people do not realize is that this result is not unique to squares. Triangles mm -hmm. exhibit the same property as also shown in figure 2-1. Um, hmm. Wow. But oh, this, okay. This, we double x here to create hmm. the 4, but look, it... When he yeah. dissects, he has to dissect three times, not twice. Very mm. interesting. This is going to be worth pondering and meditating on. Yeah, throwing it to my math people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Trying, triangling versus squaring. Okay. Yeah, that's what that's what that diagram is. Triangling yep. versus squaring. Okay. Furthermore, explains Fuller, triangles take up only half the space because every square divides into two triangles. Triangles in general, therefore, provides, provide a more efficient diagram for the mathematical function of multiplying a number by itself. Nature is always most economical. Therefore, nature is not squaring, she is triangling. I like this. <laughs> I know uh, Richard has brought this up, a number of times, but for the first time, I'm seeing it uh, exactly what he means. Okay, and what you're referring to, yeah, Richard. Happily, the same is true in three dimensions. The increasing volumes of subdivided tetrahedra, if this is an unfamiliar shape, wait until the next chapter. Wow. Supply the third power values just as accurately as do subdivided cubes. Two to, to the power of three is eight, a three to the power of three, 
or three cubed is 27, four cubed is 64, etc. Tetrahedra, of course, take up less room than cubes. And to Bucky, the choice is clear. We do not at this point in the, in the text have the necessary experience to fully understand the third power model shown in figure 2-2. But the relevant principles will eventually be discussed. Hmm. Cool. Cubing versus tetrahedron. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the things I'll just say really quickly is when we're thinking about the utterances of words, I mean, even the sounds that come out, and I was thinking about this, you know, even if I, you know, call, um, you know, uh, a cat a dog or whatever like that it's just this it's a sound like what what actually gives it meaning behind it is is the really important thing is that kind of it, there's an agreement that people have for words like as to what the meaning of a word is and then when we kind of create these words uh and put them in the context of what we're actually saying that um that you know then it starts to shape our sense of perception based off of that so it's kind of even being mindful about our words when we're actually using them it, it's it's not only it's the idea that we're actually just questioning what something actually is as the more important process than anything else is that we're going through and through something and reconciling what a concept is uh, so another example is, um, our ability to sometimes our ability to reconcile concepts is really kind of important in the sense that, um, having a, you know, having a conversation with somebody earlier this week, they were talking about the idea of the same and what the person said to them was really, they meant what was some, like something alike versus same uh which you know same means the same exact characteristics of something where alike has similar characteristics within it so mm -hmm. when using those two terms interchangeably like it was kind of misconstrued the idea of what the person was actually when they they said everybody's the same well they're they're alike because there's the characteristics that are involved in a likeness, but they're not the same. Um, and so that distinction, but either way that if you're, you're reconciling concepts um, and you're kind of taking what someone says, and even if they use it incorrectly, you're reconciling it. And it's that thought process that allows us for a more effective communication. Uh, and that's a really important thing because if you think about it in terms now, just as Bucky's going to ideas of geometry, the ideas, um, he, the, the example that was used is, I don't know, 18 and three, he was like, yeah, you're still reconciling concepts, right? That's mathematical concepts. He was talking about that particular instance, not in this book, but when I was talking to someone, so what's a three what does it actually mean and what does 18 mean um so we can actually reconcile the you know kind of it's having an understanding of what three actually is or what 18 actually is is really the important thing is having the ability to understand that uh and what bucky's actually saying is like getting us all on the same page by having us all on the same page that we have more effective communication and I do think, um, you know, that that a lot of our miscommunication happens sometimes when uh, when we don't necessarily think about the words that someone else is using, what they actually mean behind them, and they're trying. We're trying to figure out what each other, what we're trying to say, uh, but at the same time. The ability to reconcile the ideas of what someone is saying and what we understand it to be actually is is also a skill of sorts um not a healthy one you want to de de develop uh but nonetheless it is one that uh, because the reason why that means you're having to reconcile what someone else is saying 
Um, and the reason, another reason I think that this is important is because it's something like AI, I think will actually do this um, for us in a way and enable like kind of more official, efficient things like contracts to be written uh, where people are not necessarily misunderstanding concepts and using words that don't apply. Uh, and then that actually enables them to have uh, better coordination on that. So um, anyway, but this all comes back to the idea of words. Yeah, and I, I want to add to uh, what Joe is saying, because just now when he talked about um, the uh, up and down and sun sight and, and so on, and the fact that, um, you know, let me see, he was saying that, uh, uh, okay, um, that is an agreement, right? Um, for years, actually, I've been telling students that they, they can create their own words, you know, people just create and everybody agrees. I said, for instance, if the, the person who came up with a word for the chair and decide, they had decided to call it a duck, then we would all be sitting on ducks, you know? So it's, it's just somebody came up with a word to name it, right? And um, the, the, the best examples are today, what's happening, like you see law, right? Law, law has become a word, you know? And um, uh, fo uh, FOMO is another one, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so on. And of course, even the, the, the cops and all that bolo, Put out a bolo, right? Is a uh, short is short form for it's an acronym for um bulletin bulletin or something like that for I, I can't recall what it is, um and then you have uh, okay I should send you two videos of my two principals in my two schools trying to do um to do teenage speak right now like slay the word slay you know trying to figure out what that means um they were learning it um and then did a video on it and they were speaking about this school uh, using teenage speak right um the other one is cutting the grass it's it. I, I watched it and because they were just using those words i'm still clueless what they mean and uh, but that that is exactly what's happening young people are creating their own words and symbols and everything and you know this this thing is all over the world now are you using it in america what is it um you, can you see a, a heart mm. no. this came out from this came out from korea so if you go and, and it's the craziest thing because we have people from around the world visiting the school and things like that. And when we take a photo, somebody will always put a hand up like that. And it doesn't matter which country they come from, especially from Asia. So this is a heart for love. And then you have this and you have mm -hmm. this and it's even in mm -hmm. our emoji. You know this one? Yeah. It's actually yeah. love, right? And then now I found out there's another one like this. Half the love, half the shape of the heart sign symbol and the other half is here so if they have one hand available they go like this i'm like <laughs> it takes time to figure this out so anyway i i'll see if i can get hold of the the videos of my principles you you, you won't understand what they're talking about because they didn't give the definition and we chose not to but uh, uh, but doing teenage speak but the point is anybody can 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 create words like and we talked about uh, this will come to um the sunrise and sunset and sun clips and sun sight yeah uh, because uh, we talked about the mouse right the mouse the computer mouse okay so uh, somebody decided to name it a mouse because it looked like a mouse with a with a wire hanging uh, behind it right okay. yes so so there is this other part of language yeah it we don't we talk about accuracy and the other one we also have to talk so accuracy is actually oh. Um, and because I've been dealing with language for 38 years, but the other half of the language that makes it so difficult to acquire a language is the figurative part. Mm -hmm. The figurative mm -hmm. part of the language, you do not say what, it, what the words exactly says. So we may need to look at the words like sunrise and sunset and up and down as um, not, fig uh, not literal, but figurative. Because uh, when you say the mouse, the computer mouse, it's not a mouse but it looks like a mouse. So um, sunrise, then it looks like the sun is rising and it looks like the sun is setting, you know? So um, so this is something that will need to be pointed out. Uh, actually, the, the best part is how what y'all are doing right now, pointing out to people that these words are not accurate. You know, like I'm a language person and the up and down just blew me away, 
right? Yeah, we serious. I mean, we we all know it scientifically. We know it, but we didn't stop to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't use it. Use the word because yeah, when you're on the other side of the world, actually, your your uh, the up is on the opposite end, right? But then there is this whole thing with figurative language, and figurative language definition is this: it uh, it can be um, because it looks like is one, and the other is just has no sense, um, because. I gave uh, my students to help them understand why you got to really uh, do literature and so on, right? Because you get a lot of figurative language, which you otherwise don't get if you just read factual information, right? So um, examples like rip up, rip off, and rip into. You know, you rip up something. It's not rip anything up. It's you rip off someone. Yeah, it's cheating someone, you rip into someone, you yell at someone, you're scolding someone, right? Um, and we have like um, the word put has so many, you know, uh, prepositions attached to it. Like in one of them that showed up every now and then in our local newspapers and, and uh, things that we read off and on is put paid to. So I bring that up to the students. I said, uh, can you tell me what that means? Have you seen this before? So if you look at it as individual words, you're never going to guess what the, uh, the the meaning is, right? You know, put paid to to someone's dreams and things like this. So it's put a stop to, but then when you look at put and paid and to, it's not going to get you there, you know? So um, we went, uh, so for us, uh, when we teach English, in when I started creating the curriculum for Asia and for the non-native speakers, I, had, I actually changed out everything, everything, you know? Um, and that included, uh, you know, the way the words are used and why we, I, I do literature with um, non-native speaking uh, students from the get-go, the get-go. And, uh, and I have to point out to people, you do not learn English as a second language to become a native speaker because native speakers don't learn it that way. Okay. But then in Asia and other parts of the world, we persist in doing a second language. Um, and I realized that because when I was, I was looking for books for my secondary students um, in, for my English classes, I was like, why, why, is, why are the books so easy? Because it's the same difficulty as the ones I was teaching college students. They had done 11 years of English and I'm still doing basic English. So, and, and I cannot get books, yeah, in Asia and Malaysia at that time. Um, uh, like, uh, I, I needed native speakers, 13-year-old um, books. I couldn't get them because the secondary books in Asia were simple because the English is not strong and you still got to go back to basics. What? You know? And then um, the other one, if you want to talk about what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, language doesn't make sense whatsoever, right? Um and so teaching of grammar was ridiculous. I was cracking my head because for years when I was a child, I used to, What's, what, what do you mean you can't, cannot count hair? You know, uh, because I, I can see it. One, two, three, four, five, right? What do you mean you cannot count rice? So when, it, and it didn't occur to me until I started teaching, right? And one day I was telling the students, you know what, you cannot count money. And the student told me, yes, you can, teacher, it's $1, $2, $3, $4. I'm like, you're absolutely right. And this was something I had to deal with from, the, from young and I had no idea what, what it was. Then finally, in, in order to figure out how to explain to my students, I said, okay, okay, okay. I think I, I, I got it now. I got it. Okay, this is how... Actually, when you look at countable and uncountable nouns, it's just um, the word cannot be used to count. Nobody says that in any of the grammar books. You cannot use the word to count. You cannot say one money, two monies, as in per, per dollar. You can talk about currencies, but you cannot say one money, two monies, right? And But you can use the word dollar to count. One dollar, two dollars, three dollars. You can use cents. You can use so so. Uh, when you say um, meat, you cannot count, but you can use the word pieces to count. You can use piece to count. You can use packet to count. You can use uh, kilograms and the measurements to count. You know, milk you cannot count, but you can say a packet, a glass. A, wow, I tell you that really, and it's not in 
any grammar book that you will ever, ever find. But that was me trying to make sense. And this is what I mean by uh, just now when we talked about, um, you know, the, the fact that uh, you just need to make sense of things for children. Otherwise, you know, Joe, uh, 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 Steve, I was explaining to you, they do not know why something is uncomfortable. It's not making sense. And a lot of things that we're doing is just not making sense. And that's just one. You want me to break down all the grammar stuff that does not make sense? I have plenty. But that is the crux of it. So now coming back to language, right? Uh, as Bucky would say, yes, let's deal with the, the literal, and which is facts. And we also have to deal with the figurative side of it. Mm. Okay, so that might be something that we need to look into as we go down uh, this path, yeah. Um, and of course, math, I, I just absolutely love the way we're going with math and Bucky is going with it, yeah. So this coming, uh, no, uh, let me see, this Thursday, oh, we're off, we're off this week. Yeah, we're actually school is off this week, coming up, because we have the, the Hindu, the, the Indians are having their celebration. The week after, trust me, I'm going to bring this up, okay. Uh, I'm going to bring up the um, this uh, uh, irrationality of pi and I'm going to throw this at the, 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 at the my science and math people. And I'll tell you, because I told them to help me ask about up and down. Yeah, Richard, remember with my classes? No, I, I couldn't get, they, they couldn't push it through. But let me try it with the teachers, okay? <laughs> I've got my engineers and biomedical degree holders and let's see what comes out of it. Okay, so anyway, I'm very excited about seeing what comes out and uh, coming back to you to see what yeah. happened. I'll tell you, the <laughs> what you just said inspired me because this whole idea of sunrise, sunset, and the idea that I had this experience uh, when I was walking out at 4.30 in the morning and seeing the beautiful sky and noticing uh, the moon clips and the sunrise. And, um, and, and, by using that language, it helped me see this. I'm going to, I'm going to show you this because I think this is really powerful. And you might want to show this to, uh, I've got two really good ones to show to your family. I'm going to, I'll, I'll turn this on. Let me see. Hang on. Did I share sound? I didn't share sound. There we go. Okay, good. Here we go. slowed it down to half speed because if it's full speed it just goes a crazy can but, you show it at full speed yeah i'll show it at full speed here we go okay let's start back here at full speed here we go full speed here we go there we go so it's showing the relationship of the earth to the other uh stars and the, and the sun Our solar system is at a 60 degree angle in the uh, galaxy. It's moving at 230 kilometers per second. There's a couple of uh, asteroids, make a makey, mm. that are going around the solar system. There's Pluto's orbit around the outside. Oh. I mean, sunrise, sunset just doesn't get this. Yes. This yes. is reality. This is reality. Can you share this? Uh, oh, wait. I oh, yeah. Think I oh, yeah. Right I'll, share, I'll share another one, too, that's more simple than this. This one's real complicated. But see, it's showing our galaxy. That's our solar system rotating around in the galaxy. That's, that's the excellent. orbit of our solar system in our galaxy. It takes 230 million years for our solar system to orbit around the galaxy. 
Wow. Say, say it again. How many years? 230 million. Two hundred thirty. Right it shows it right here. Uh, watch. Oh, right, right. I see it. Yeah. 230 million years. That's our solar system rotating around in our galaxy. This one, I'll put this one down. Let me see here. How solar system really works. Uh, I'll put that in the chat. And um, oh, yes, I'm going to toss it at my teachers. And then let me and I've got one more that's actually you want to save this one. This is the this is the Ph.D. one right here. Uh, let me show you the um, the one before this, which is much more simple. OK, here we go. Now, is this a full speed? Yeah, this is normal speed. Here we go. But see this, where is the sunrise? <laughs> where Where is the sunrise and the sunset? So, you know, that's a really simple one. Um, but, um, but anyway, then here's, so there's a whole slew of them here. Um, and yeah. Yeah, just the topic of the spiraling earth. Uh, I'll put that in the chat too because that that was one of the things mm -hmm. I that's what I put into Google. And then wow. And yeah, so something okay. I mean I mean there's uh, how the earth really moves through the universe. Um let's do this one. Oh, that's the, that's this guy. Yeah. Oh, this is the guy from BBC talking about it. This video of the planets moving in a corkscrew pattern isn't exactly wrong, but it's often presented in the most misleading sense by suggesting that the old idea of planets orbiting the sun is wrong and that we really move in a cool vortex. This is misleading because it suggests that one frame of reference, the one where we see this helix, is fundamentally better than any others. Today, I'm going to say a word or two against this sort of reference frame chauvinism and then talk about how Earth really moves through the universe, which involves a surprising amount of awesome astrophysics. To start, I want you to imagine that you're in a ship moving steadily on a perfectly smooth ocean in an enclosed cabin. The portals are closed, so there's no way you can tell how fast you're moving, or even that you're moving at all. This is the thought experiment that Galileo Galilei described in his 1632 book, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, to express what we now call Galilean relativity. It's the idea that there's no single best frame of reference from which to define the concept of stillness. There's no absolute rest frame. All non-accelerating frames, also called inertial frames, can be taken as motionless as far as the laws of physics are concerned. So, okay, so this goes on for another 19 minutes. I don't know that it's worthwhile, but it certainly will give an explanation of why the other diagrams that I've shown you are so important. And I put that in here too, how the Earth really moves to the it, galaxy, there's the link. Yeah. So, uh, and as I walked outside, at 4.30 in the morning and at 6.30 in the morning, I had a sense of this spiraling. And I'm not gonna get the spiraling, I'm not gonna get the sense of spiraling if I'm just simply talking about um, the earth, the sunrise and the sunset, you know? So anyway, I thought I'd throw that in there. So I hope those are helpful to you, especially if you're gonna tackle yes. your teachers. You gotta blow their brains out before you can teach them something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah. It, Thank you. It's, yeah. Really, let, I mean, let uh, me uh, relate two two experiences. <laughs> cool. I'm gonna take off the share, Richard. We can't see you. Yeah, I, my camera is not working for some reason. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll pretend like we're watching your mouth move. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, one is is contemporary in the sense of, uh, especially. Uh, U.S. politics right now and over the past number of years and the, the emphasis on the big lie and everybody getting sort of all up in a knot over 
whether someone is telling the truth about something. Yeah. Uh, and just as Anne was talking about a few minutes ago, uh, the context sort of allows people in a figurative way to say uh, that I am telling the truth uh, when I say, you know, the election was stolen. Um, but, but what Bucky, I think, was really concerned about is this, that, um, as he said it many times, that because we won't uh, match the language um, of sunrise and sunset as an example to what's really happening, we're perpetuating what uh, a big lie. And he always used to sort of, um, in a sense, uh, probably chide the, the uh, scientific specialists in the world of saying, you're perpetuating a big lie. And so why do you do it? Um, especially when science is based on the notion of telling the truth. Uh, so when the, we had the mil Millennium Experience in 2000, um, I started writing letters to the editor of, of several uh, papers saying, you now have a chance to correct what is actually happening because you're sending journalists to um, an island off of New Zealand, so you'll be the first in the world to, to experience the sun rise <laughs> in the new millennium. And they were also sending people, uh, to, I don't know, I think it's to places like Iceland and whatnot, where they would, they would experience the, um, uh, sunset. The, 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 yeah, the sunset. Um, and I wrote a number of letters and saying, here's your chance to tell the truth. <laughs> and and I never did get a reply from anyone. Um, and then we also have the other uh, circumstance right now is people uh, putting down those who believe in the flat earth. And we laugh at them and we think it's uh, they're kind of weird. Uh, and yet, because we use this kind of language of up and down and so forth, um, that's exactly the context that we are coming from as well. Mm. Um, so um, if you actually talk and experience the world as a flat world, because that's how it feels, <laughs> uh, then how can we be uh, self-righteous about flat earthers claiming that the earth is flat or politicians claiming the election was stolen <laughs> and and how can the fact sort of seekers um, put down those who are perpetuating lies when they're doing mm -hmm. it themselves <laughs> so it, and it's to me it it's in a teaching kind of ex experience it's like you're putting the, the question out there almost in the Socratic way to to get your students thinking about all this. Yeah. You're not trying to tell them that one is right and the other one's wrong, but you're trying to get them to, to think about how important it is to put context and, and accuracy together so that right. you understand both the, the actual word, but you also understand its uh, context. And so figuratively, it may be different than what the word itself is, is trying to define or describe. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the beauty of what I think Anne's doing in her work is, is that um, I think you're getting students to be real critical thinkers. And at the same time, you're getting students who feel that they can go out into the world with something practical and, and realistic to offer um, in, in entrepreneurial uh, efforts or, or maybe some other effort, but they're, they're, <clears throat> you're going out of the education experience with something that they can um, apply in the new world or the new context that they're now in as young adults. Um, and and I can really appreciate what, what Anne must have been going through over all these years 
of being so frustrated with the the uh, um, the, stat the status quo of how you're supposed to teach something. <laughs> Um, yeah. and now and, and on a smaller scale, I suppose, uh, I saw the same thing at the university, uh, trying to introduce some of these concepts that we're talking about, even trying to introduce, um, Amy's book, Fuller Explanation. I, I put it out in front of students to, to read and think about, and <clears throat> my guess from the, the feedback that I got is, is that very few did. <laughs> very yeah. few really were able to think about it in anything other than um, perhaps thinking it was novel, but just going back to what they've been taught all the way along. Um, yeah. And and they, um, the final one is is the triangle, and and what's the sum of the angles, and and we we all come out with the idea that it's one hundred and eighty and. And we don't have any inclination of the answer that Bucky comes up with and says, "No, that's not right. It's uh, you got to count the inside and the outside." Yes. Um, and so it perpetuates the notion of the only thing that's important is what's inside a boundary. Um, so it's again, it becomes my culture, my nation, uh, myself, <laughs> uh, my company. You know. I'm, I get more and more frustrated these days when you hear people say, wherever they live, my country is the best country in the world. <laughs> and and it's true. It's uh, we, we have a contextual belief in terms of our, our own lived experiences so that um, we do. And yet, <clears throat> if we understood it well, um, I think we would stop trying to proclaim that we are the best uh, country or best whatever, um, when in fact we know that our neighbor in another country is probably saying the same thing. <laughs> um, and anyway, that's. Uh, I'm glad I was able to uh, tap in just as you were reading the sunrise sunset part of her. You know, when I was a kid in school back in the 50s, America was pretty much number one in about everything. World War II had just ended. You know, all the economies were trashed. The U.S. economy prospered because we built the weapons and put it together. But over the years, the U.S. has gone down, 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 down in many, 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 many categories. And the average American has no concept about that. I mean, we have some of the highest uh, fatality rates among newborns, right? Not mothers in birth in, in America than mm. a lot of countries. And uh, Cuba's ahead of us in some of those categories, you know, in some of these countries that are communist and not cool. So I sure relate, Richard, to you sharing about how I think my country is the best. And if yeah. I look at this facts, if I look at the statistics, I don't care how good my country is. Some other country is doing a better job at something. Right. Yeah. The other thing, what, Richard, as you okay, do you want to throw something in there? I got it. Okay. Because the other thing, as you spoke, Richard, one thing that kept ringing to me is, okay, when is when is it not good to lie? How many, how much lying can I do to my kids? And it's okay. I can right. lie this much. But anything more than that is too much of a lie. I mean, uh, and by saying sunrise, sunset, by using these terms that are so local and so not true to the phenomenon of this planet, um, I, I just, I keep asking, as you were talking, I kept asking myself, well, how much lying is okay? How big of a lie can I tell before I step over the line and the lie is too big? I, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Why lie at all? Wow. Anyway, that kept that struck me, Richard. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, I, I want to add. I want to add something as well. Um. So Richard, we will we will work towards getting these information, the correct information, out to the children, um, as as far as we can. Um. And I know that we're gonna have the opportunity to impact at least 
uh, three more countries outside of our own that's coming up. I'll share with you uh, what's happening. Um, first is I'm already getting my uh, econs people to start thinking of uh, cosmic accounting has no bankruptcy. Mm. You know, is and 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 they have already redefined the 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 study of economics instead of, um, you know, the management of scarce resources to a uh, management of resources, so they they've gone down that path, um. But now we we have the opportunity to impact at the moment. Two countries, there'll be two more that's coming up that's coming our way, or the other one is um, you know, this whole sunrise sun sunset and everything, and up and down. Uh, we will work towards getting the kids to understand what is fact and what is language, you know, and so that it comes up as facts in their studies that the, for, for the teachers to point out, yeah? Um, so I'm working towards well, that. And I think what we're looking at today, I was just gonna say that get them onto the times tables in the way in which we just looked at yes. them. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the other thing uh, I'm gonna be uh, working on is also uh, making maybe, because every, um, over time we do have, um, uh, my, my daughter, my daughter will do book, book reading with uh, the staff, you know, and they'll come together. They've read uh, books like Tribal Leadership and the other ones read Radical Candor, things like that. Um, so I'm going to suggest to her to take, just to get our science and economics people on board to go through um, Amy Edmondson's book. I think it's less, mm. book, like it's, uh, it's an easier, uh, you know, take on Bucky. Um, so I, I'm going to suggest that. So yeah, we're going to be doing that. Um, so uh, Japan is another country that's coming coming in to speak to us because um, uh, on the 7th, I'm having... Did, did I talk about this, Joe, last week? That on the 7th? The Japanese, there's a Japanese company, huge yes. energy company. company. Yeah. yeah. Wind turbine, they're coming over and uh, they're very interested in the uh, environmental program that we created because our focus was um, was not, uh, we, and we are redefining pollution there to something that nobody has figured out a use for yet and that's driving us. Um, and then the fact that, uh, and anyway, we were focusing very much on uh, urban environmental issues rather than uh, what is out there in the in the wild, right? Because uh, children cannot and teenagers have no, there's no reality for them on that one. So the the bulk of it is actually urban uh, regenerative work for the kids, right? But at the same time, we take them out and to, to nature where the nature people will be able to teach them, you know, actually what is going on rather than we try to do it theoretically. So um, they are seriously looking at our program, even though there's another school they looked at, but they felt that that one doesn't work for them because I know that school is way too old. It's like taking people back to, to maybe 200 years ago or without electricity and things like this, you know, um, and, and like uh, our uh, petrol propelled cars and things like this, right? But anyway, um, that's coming up. And uh, so we are going to be able to um, impact Japan in that way. Um, and they have a green school there in one of the islands. Uh, no, one of the, yeah, in, in this area called Fukuoka. Um, then the other one that's coming our way also is to impact the girls of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the ladies came to speak to us and she said, you know, we need a different education in Japan because it's educating the girls to be good mothers, on um, good wives, sorry, good wives, educating women to be good wives. And they wanted a change. And so we're like, yeah, bring it on. We're, we're ready to help uh, with that, you know, if, if, um, if they take us on and we can move forward with them. So yeah, um, so... Thailand is the fourth country. So the, and now the resources are coming our way to be able to impact beyond uh, Malaysia. Uh, I'll update you all more. as And so Bucky is going to come right along, okay? <laughs> I've, been tossing, I've been tossing cosmic integrity at uh, my Indonesian partner and telling him that, uh, you know, and uh, I went down the path, quite a few things like nature has no pollution and all that. And he He's like, wow, and I've never heard you speak like that. And and he, he loves discussions like this, you know? So yeah, we're doing that. The other day I had just, oh, yesterday I had a, uh, 
a, a developer uh, coming to our school, talking to us about education and you know, looking at how we can do this together. And I was throwing Bucky Fuller at him too. <laughs> so young. <laughs> and, they, and most people have not heard, definitely not in Malaysia. Very few people have heard of Bucky. Yeah. Okay. Very few people so, in the United States have heard of Bucky. I've, oh, I've talked to several oh, guys sure. who are, uh, you know, at the Vipassana. Some of them, some at my retreat, a couple of them were pretty space cadet you know. Some of them have been into sacred geometry, but very few of them knew anything about Buckminster Fuller. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So we're going to pop into the sciences. What is fact and what isn't based on the language? Okay. So we'll pull that together. Yeah. Sorry, Joe, you're going to say something? No, no. I mean, I, I think that that's something that's actually interesting because, you know, in a few of the different conversations that I have um, that not a lot of people, um, when, when I bring up uh, Barky's name, is not as well known as as you would think, especially even in terms of systems thinking sometimes. Yeah. Uh, which is even actually... In architecture. That's it, yeah. I oh. mean, that's where it's really kind of shocking a little bit. Uh where it's it's some of the lack of knowledge when it comes to domain specific um individuals that's where it's uh, you know i can see maybe you know a little bit more uh, sometimes in the mainstreams you know if you asked people about famous architects in general they may not be able to say frank lloyd wright or you know louis sullivan or anybody or you know that it's and, and those are mainstream names uh and so I understand that, but even uh, you know, in the systems thinkers realm, uh, that sometimes people don't, or even the architecture realm, that sometimes people don't talk about Bucky when he's and and his um and his understanding of of structures is you know I think one of those things that almost would be fundamental. Um, but I would like to the well, see, and then you know, the, but one of the things that I wanted to keep saying. We keep coming back to here is uh, that um, in general is that I think it's uh, also important is, you know, one of the things we were talking about a moment ago when I was talking, and I'm just thinking about everything we're saying here about words, language, and everything and what we mean and, and how they're used and how they're distorted um, that this can be discussed and during dialogue you know that is something that is when we're having a conversation we can reconcile these ideas we can talk about these ideas and actually we can come to a better understanding of what the ideas are actually mean uh so that's one of those essential elements of dialogue in general and but compare and contrast that to what I was just saying a moment ago, where I do think AI could actually do something uh, very effective, um, which is in writing contracts. And the reason I say that is because this comes back to the idea of what is written down cannot be interrogated. So the idea that you're going to interrogate kind of like we can talk about it in terms of kind of reconciling these concepts and ideas and words whereas something written down is just written down you have to take it for what it is and uh you know and that distinction is really important because when you think about even just large-scale projects and things along those lines and you have the written this well this is what it says you know and well, what did it? What did the person actually mean? And then, if you're talking about multiple domains and then you have massive projects, then you know those that confusion and misinterpretations or misapplications of not only the words but sometimes flat out the the um, uh, the um, the methods, I would say, uh, in, in the sense that you know of um, even if the methods and the words are actually matched up, sometimes people misapply the methods themselves. Uh, that that the the uh, ability to kind of do that in a way with some degree of fidelity will actually eliminate a lot of confusion. 
Um, so this is like, again, this is something that is in one in Plato's dialogues. I mean, there was some, there was a lot more than just this, um, but it was the ability to, uh, when the oral word, the spoken word can be in, inter you know, interrogated. Whereas like, what do you mean by this? And you can keep coming back and forth until you have a, both have a deeper understanding of what something is. Where if, again, is something written down, it becomes problematic because there's just what was written down and things can be taken out of context. Uh, and this has other ramifications, even something like a lot of people would say, Nietzsche's work uh, is the following, uh, you know, the way it was used by as propaganda by the Nazi party, that something like that was, you know, you're taking these written words reinterpreting them in a certain narrative and they're written down and, and it becomes like kind of what people are then just saying they're not there's no defense of these words um so but all i'm pointing out is that when it comes to the written word the fidelity is that much more important uh when it comes to the spoken word that it's important, but at least there's something that can be, can be corrected. And I think that that's where, again, coming back to even dialogue is so important uh, because that's how we learn from each other. Yeah. Cool. So, Richard, were you holding on to a comment there? Uh, no, I mean, Oh, I know what it was. Um, the very fact that we're having this kind of discussion around uh, Amy's book, that fuller explanation, and what, and the kind of thoughts that we've just had, uh, and just say what Anne has in mind in terms of maybe she can get some other people to sort of start to go through uh, that kind of writing, um, and it. And, and to know that today, Amy has been writing about failing well, um, mm. how, how to fail uh, successfully. And mm. what she's written has been so successful that that, that book has out uh, sort of competed, if you want, dozens of other books to end up be called, being named the, the best book in, I forget what the series is. But she's had that happen uh, once, maybe even twice. And it almost mm -hmm. uh, struck me as we're talking that at some point, it would be nice, maybe, maybe we can do it in some way, is to go back to Amy and say, I think you need to go back to fuller explanation and what you were doing back then and get it out into the public in the same way you're getting out uh, failing successfully. And the two are really, um, if you want a match made in heaven, <laughs> and, and to have somebody like Amy who learned how to articulate fuller in a sort of a layman's, uh, layperson's language, um, and, uh, and has been so successful in, in writing about what she's doing now from, largely from an organizational perspective, I think, um, that if she returned to her roots and and brought Fuller back into the public domain in the way, uh, well, in, in a way to correct what we've just said a few minutes ago, who knows anything about Bucky? Nobody knows anything about him in, in lots of ways. Um, and uh, and yet there's, there's a lot of people that are... Uh, uh, probably more connected to him than sometimes we realize. And I'll just give you another quick story of, of me when I was in India in 94, and I was fresh into Bucky's thinking. And so I would try and um, use his name in some way in every conversation that I came up with. So uh, I was taken out to a, a, a company uh, business club in Bangalore, India, and the people who took me there brought along another couple uh, 
as their friends and guests. And we had dinner together in a, you know, a high class sort of private club. And so somewhere in the evening, I decided to drop Bucky's name to sort of say, you know, have you ever heard about him and so forth and so on. And, and as I said, whatever few words I did say, when I was finished, the, the guest, uh, the gentleman that was there with his wife, he just kind of looked at me in, in this one-upmanship sort of way. He says, yeah, I know all about Bucky. I'm an architect, and I worked with him in building the new airport in New Delhi. Ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that, was, that, was, that was the end of me being sort of uh, uh, <laughs> profound in my reference to Bucky. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Richard, yes, I, I had a similar <laughs> experience with uh, my ex-students uh, group. You know, he, he has this uh, group of people that he saw mentors, you know. Um, and so they they help them grow in, in their business and they come from a few countries from Japan, Thailand, Malaysia and so on. So um, I, we didn't know that one of the guys actually uh, told had a meeting with Blair Singer. Yeah. And because Blair, Kelly, Rich, uh, this uh, Kelly Ritchie, Ke I mean, Kelly and uh, of course, Robert Kiyosaki all have got the background with uh, Bucky Fuller. Right. So um they had a meeting with Blair Singer and they, they talked about our school, you know, uh, <laughs> and Blair, Blair knows us very well, right? He knows us very well. So he was, he was very happy also at the feedback that we got. So, but the key thing is that that whole group of people, and this, this is very, very odd to find, yeah? are really, really proponents of Bucky and Bucky's teachings and so on and so forth, you know? Um, so then I, I can't recall what it was that he, he they told, um, they told uh, uh, this Blair, um, our school, but using using Bucky's term. I, I got to recall that, and I'll come back to you on that one. So that was really interesting. So that's about the only group that has de uh, delved deeper into uh, Bucky, and I'll I'll be uh, my I think my daughter will be working quite closely with one of them to do something in uh, Japan, and then um, but my ex student, um, I I keep in touch with him, so we're going to be working something together. Uh, with his, um, he has got it, a system for, uh, hmm, I can't recall, but it's actually about helping companies with, uh, with um, you know, the, with the, how to get the revenue up and profitability up and all that. So he has a way to do that and working closely. But, you know, you, you come across people who work very, very closely and, and yeah, so I'm, I'm very, I'm very thrilled. So we'll catch up and do more with them. Okay. So that's, that's what I think. Yeah. That's one thing really quickly, and I, and I think this is really, really important to what you brought up a little bit earlier. Um, uh, even when you're just you know, talking about cosmic accounting, because um, I actually think that that's actually going to be one of the more important things um, going forward uh, in the sense of actually understanding uh, what is value. Um, and uh, you know, not necessarily just looking at it from a very narrow domain specific perspective, uh, in the sense that, um, well, one looking at it from a scarcity that's that's number one, but also looking at it from just a uh, monetary perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and this is you know, one thing I've, I've had several conversations um, about. Uh, is this idea of change. And, you know, you think about what can be changed and what can't be changed. Um, and things about thinking about things only in monetary perspectives, uh, meaning, you know, that it's a something of a value that we assign to it. Um, and uh, how we think about um, that it's arbitrary uh, from, you know, from that perspective. Um, and cosmic accounting really kind of thinks about that or discusses that. And if we think about even terms that we're, you know, we're talking about the idea of terms. Well, you know, you, when you're talking about terms was, you know, can you put measurements to it? So what is the measurement that become the measurement becomes something more. And I would say it's no longer just GDP. It's about well-being. And that shift 
from looking at things from a uh instead of looking at it from uh scarcity and abundance uh you know you look at it from surviving to thriving uh mm -hmm. and so that that's a different perspective uh completely uh, and i think that this is where you know even uh, a lot of people are talking about things from even sustainability to regenerative you know that kind of movement and that perspective um and those types of words uh and the meanings behind those words have um you know it, it, it it's really when you brought that up that your economic people are kind of working on that mm -hmm. uh i think that that's actually um uh it goes to the heart of what we've been discussing uh because sometimes we assign a value misassigned value to to something that's arbitrary i'd like to uh and joe rather than as what i'm learning tonight is one of this in one of his terms is finite accounting as opposed to cosmic accounting cosmic accounting sounds kind of like cosmic where finite accounting may be more finite more maybe get people's attention and the definition of finite accounting is event event accounting rather than itemizing accounting and which puts things in context and groups what i'd like to do you guys is like finite to... and scarcity what's that yeah, finite and scarcity as well like the idea of finite sometimes yeah. in scarcity they're, they're finite as opposed yeah. to abundance kind of the idea well uh, cool. So let's finish because we've only got like a little paragraph here to go. And then I know we're pushing the clock, but we started a little bit late, but let's go ahead and finish this. Um, who wants Until to read? I can, I can go mm -hmm. ahead. Okay. Uh, note that the tetrahedron alone cannot fit together face to face to form larger tetrahedrons tetrahedra to tetrahedra large to the larger tetrahedra shown. They must alternate with octahedra as explored in chapters 8, 9, 10, 12, 13. The volume values shown employ a unit tetrahedron as one unit of volume in the same manner that a unit length cube is conventionally employed. Despite the tetrahedron's inability to fill space, the relative volumes of tetrahedra of increasing size are identical to those exhibited by cubes of increasing size. So she obviously understands something there and trying to just clarify to make sure that nobody makes any assumptions. And we just have a little bit more to read here. Joe, do you want to continue? Sure. The point to be made now is that the squares and cubes cannot boast a special inherent significance for multiplicative accounting. Triangles and tetrahedra are equally reliable and in some ways more reliable, as we shall see. Fuller argues that our, our arbitrary habitual references to squares and cubes keep us locked into a right-angled viewpoint, which obscures our vision of the truth. From now on, says Bucky, we have to say triangulating, not squaring, if we want to play the game the, the way nature plays it. Very cool. That way we end on visual literacy, and we can begin on that page, um, page 27 next week everybody complete with that any comments yeah. questions before we do our takeaways richard i didn't cut you off on the on anything there did i no no I've, uh, I've got a takeaway that uh, is somewhat related to uh, our discussions but also related to uh, a dinner i just had with some former students so when i get to that i'll and it uh, connects with Anne. <laughs> I want to well, get the message wanna, out to Anne. If you want to go for it, Richard, how are you feeling and what's your takeaway? Well, I'm, I'm feeling um, reinvigorated since uh, I was up at four o'clock yesterday morning for some meetings and I took a flight out of Vancouver uh, in the evening, got to Maui at about uh, 2.30, my time <laughs> and got up quite early and then realized that hey i can make this meeting at five o'clock hawaii time <laughs> uh i was a little bit off but uh it's uh we've had a good day of visiting and 
and this is a, a great way to top off the evening. But what I want to, uh, it's not so much a takeaway, it's a giveaway to, to Anne, is that I had a, a meeting with, uh, a dinner with, with three former students, two of whom um, were in a hill tribe in, in Thailand that I helped arrange for a field practicum. Uh, uh, but one of them is a, um, was born in, in Malaysia, and I just realized she said she was actually born in Sanart. Is that it? Uh, in Borneo? Uh, yes, what? Sarawak. Is it Sarawak? Sar yeah. Anyway, um, she's in her, in her 40s, I believe. And for some reason, she has decided to take a, sort of a pilgrimage trip uh, on her own um, back to her homeland, which is Malaysia, uh, then to Singapore and to other countries. And uh, she's leaving in January and coming back maybe in, in, July, or in Jan June. And I said, well, I've got to get you introduced to Anne because I told her a little bit about you. And so I'm going to be sending you the name of, of my former student. Her name is uh, Rosalind Kang, K-A-N-G. Um, and and she's just heading out in January. She doesn't have a prearranged plan. So whatever the universe decides uh, her experience is going to be, she's going to try and follow it. Um, sure. <laughs> so I think I said to her, you'll, you're going to love meeting Anne. And I'm pretty sure that uh, you're going to feel the same way about her. So that's my big uh, uh, takeaway giveaway to uh, uh, our discussions and to share with, with Anne that uh, there'd be somebody coming her way and knocking on her door saying, yeah. uh, hello, <laughs> probably in January, February. So how are you feeling, uh, Joe, and your takeaway? Um, you know, I'm feeling very good. Um, it's... Uh, you know, as I said, it's very um, good to have these types of conversations when we're going back over some of these ideas. Uh, and it is the ability to go through dialogue and, and um, you know, to think through these topics and actually to see how uh, they're being applied, um, whether, you know, through the ideas that Anne shared, um, maybe some of the ideas that I shared a little bit earlier, uh, and you know and what steve has shared uh, as well as and and as well as you richard it's just to, to be able to have those different experiences and that dialogue i think is uh essential um because again it's it's uh not only the the words we use but it's uh how we understand the concepts sometimes uh and you know those there are moments where uh you know we just take take the conversation and and think about it afterwards um and so my takeaways from that uh are the various examples that we used uh specifically obviously one is going to be the cosmic accounting uh example that anna was talking about specifically uh, and just writing about uh, that idea of um you know what does it really mean in the cosmic sense and what does it mean in in the in the finite financial sense uh and that's and thinking about it in terms of um when uh i think it's thinking about terms in holistic ways uh as opposed to uh very domain specific narrow ways so when we think about things only from the perspective of a uh, financial account, and this is Bucky covers this, I think, well, actually covers this well in, in Critical Path, um, that when uh, the founders of companies would often lose their sight of what was really valuable, um, and that it was the financialization of their company. And so that they start manage themselves to the finances as opposed to why they were doing something in the first place. 
and that distortion, uh, just as if there's distortions in our words, uh, can have grave consequences uh, in, in our behaviors. Uh, so um, I, I think that by you know, going through this idea of something that's more holistic, uh, cosmic versus just a financial perspective, uh, gets us away from that transactional perspective uh, and, and has us thinking more in terms of um, uh, relationships. So not only in terms of relationships, but, uh, you know, I think that this is something where uh, did, did we were talking about this when we first came on the call, the idea of what does it mean to, uh, you know, in five years, six years, 10 years, uh, it, what, what's it going to be like? What What's the world going to be like? And uh, one of those things that uh, is both, um, uh, I think, really important to, to consider is... Um, what is meaningful because there are going to be things that may be automated uh, that had never been automated before. And I've had very, you know, a lot of different conversations as far as how people identify maybe with, well, you know, their job or something like that, or financial things in a very narrow sense. Uh, and kind of that reorientation that has to come along uh, with what is truly meaningful, which is the relationships between uh, people, is a more cosmic approach versus a, versus the very domain specific financial approach. So having that perspective, um, you know, and and talking about these concepts, uh, and uh, you know, and, and we've talked about it in the past. Even Wayne, I remember specifically. Uh, was um, talking about Cosmic County in, a couple of years ago uh, when he was talking about the uh, uh, very interesting, and I'll finish over here, is that where there was a son that had gone off to school, learned accounting, and the father had owned a business and had run the business well, and the son came home, and so it's like a, it's like a uh, almost a, a parable that um, the son came home and basically said, you know, you're you're doing all your accounting wrong and everything, you're doing everything wrong uh, because of he, what he had learned at school and completely ignoring the fact that he had sent all four of them to school, he had provided for them and done all those other things that actually do matter, that, that actually does matter. So the kid went out and learned and got specialized and came back and told his father, you're doing everything wrong. Yet everything that the kid, everything that was truly meaningful was then lost. It's because when they, when they, when the kid's son came home, they didn't look at the fact that the, you know, siblings went to school, didn't look at the fact that they had a family and all those other wonderful things. He was only looking at the financial transaction. And that's the narrow type of thinking that actually perverts our perspective on the world. So that's all to say that looking at things from uh, a kind of not just the domain perspective, not to discount the domain, but not just the domain perspective, um, I think is part of that kind of reconciliation of concepts in general. So, uh, and what do you... How do you feel and what are you taking away from today? Yep. Uh, I'm just grateful that we we stayed on the call. Yes, yeah, yeah, Steve. And uh, the discussion has been very rich, you know. Um, so there's, there's so much here. Um, and uh, one one of the big things is actually like uh, the, this, this whole thing about, Steve, you bringing up this event science versus irrational science. Now that, that the term, please, I'm going to, I'm going to throw it to my teachers as well. Um, and then uh, finite accounting, event accounting was what you said as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's on the page. It's on the page there. I'll find it while you finish. Yeah, because I I saw the finite accounting. Yes, but uh, uh, 
we talk thinking from it from event accounting. Okay, that's something to look at. Um, so there's a lot that we're going to be doing, and I'll update y'all on it. And uh, it's been such such a wonderful morning for me. Um, Rich, uh, Richard, thank you so much for your giveaway. A huge gift for me, and yeah, let her know. Um, I will be happy to to work with her, talk to her, spend time with her. Um, and uh, the best way actually to uh, uh get through to me is our group chat. You know, the rather than my email, I'll lose stuff okay. in there. Yeah, because these these things are very time sensitive. As so well, when when she's coming, I don't want to like not see your your email like over weeks or months. Yeah, so anything just uh, the group chat would be great. Thank you very, very much. Looking forward to that. Um, Steve, great. Great. how do you feel and what is your takeaway? Well, I'm like you, Anne, I'm really thrilled. I'm so delighted that you uh, had the commitment to say, hey, let's just go for this. And then jo <laughs> Joe joined us and Richard joined us and it ended up being a very rich uh, conversation. I'm really, really thrilled. Um, I'm delighted. Um, I'm going to find that quote from Bucky that talks about finite accounting from on event based. It was right just the paragraph before where we started tonight. So I'm going to uh, the validity of a finite accounting system, and I'm going to just take it and post it in the uh, chat because I think it it was really you know this event based. So like instead of taking like a triangle so and teaching and people about triangles, why not teach them about an event which involves triangles? Then I have triangles in a context and I'm, I have an event-based educational system, an event-based accounting system. I, I just think that whole concept is really profound and I'm really grateful for Bucky and I'm gonna paste it in right now. There it is. And it's at the bottom of page or it's in the middle of, it's right above which way is up in the middle of page 23. Yeah. So I'm going to put down there page 23 and I'm putting that in the chat. The validity of a finite accounting system. We could hypothesize a system in which volume was tallied in terms of the number of photons in a given space and area, the number of photons found at the surface. However, it would be a fantastically impractical system. A more appropriate unit is called for. For now, however, we simply consider the qualitative implications of discrete events concepts. A punctuated reality is hard to get used to. A punctuated reality is hard to get used to. And that talks about finite accounting systems and discrete event concepts. So you're going to have to manipulate that a little bit. I manipulate a little bit, come up with my summary statement, and hopefully you'll be able to, to work with it. Yeah, I too am really thrilled to be stuck with this. Um, and delighted, Joe, that you showed up, and uh, Richard, that you showed up. Anne and I could have handled it just fine, but you guys added a lot of depth to it, and I appreciate you guys very, very much. And I'm glad to be back home, and um, looking forward to uh, our next chat. Very good. Yep, thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.